This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Fiscally responsible, financial geniuses, monetary magicians. These are things people say about drivers who switch their car insurance to Progressive and save hundreds. Visit Progressive.com to see if you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states or situations. Stop. (coughs) Stop. (coughs) Stop. Had enough? Kick out mucus and quiet the cough with Mucinex 12-Hour DM for long-lasting cough and chest congestion relief. Buy Mucinex 12-Hour DM at your local retailer. Use as directed. When you picture an undecided voter right now, a week ahead of the presidential election, who comes to mind? We know they're out there, or we think we do. Some of the most recent political polling shows that Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are running neck and neck, each of them nabbing 48% of the vote, which leaves 4% of people who are voting for Jill Stein or maybe just haven't made up their minds yet. And it's these elusive voters who could end up deciding this thing. Yeah. Who are they? (laughs) Like, I can't imagine being undecided at this point in the race. Right. It's like, yeah, really, just like a coin flip between their policies, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. I called up political strategist Michael Podhorzer because he has some thoughts about undecideds. Mostly that the rest of us are thinking about these people and how they see the candidates all wrong. I think that the reason it's hard to imagine who they are is that um, what we imagine they're telling us when they say they're undecided, we want it and take it for granted that it means that they could possibly vote for either. And for the most part, that is not the case. He says, picture a voter in one of the big swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. They've got literature papering their front porch. They flip on the TV. It is wall-to-wall presidential ads. And the questions they are being asked to consider are very familiar. If you live in one of those states, then it's basically Groundhog Day. You know, our politics has their presidential elections have become something like a skipping record, right? Can't move forward or backward. Wouldn't you rather just sit this one out? There's a long line of research that shows that most people who are undecided at this stage just stay home. So they're deciding about whether to To go to their polling site. Yeah. And the real, quote, swing voter is this set of voters who really are alienated from the parties and alienated from politics and really only show up when they feel like they have something to lose in the election. And that was what powered Biden's victory four years ago. Do you think it's going to power anything for the candidates this time around? Yeah, it's agonizingly still too early to tell. You have until Tuesday to vote. It is the final week before the election. And in seven swing states, the candidates are tied. So we're looking at the people and places that could tip the scales. Today on the show, the undecided. Just what are they undecided about? Anyway, I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. There is joy in finding the perfect gift for the ones you love. But it can be a challenge. Sax.com's holiday gift guide makes it easy. Whether you are surprising your hard-to-shop-for sister with a Chloe bracelet bag or gifting your partner a memorable scent from Gucci. At Sax.com, there is holiday inspiration for every personality on your list. If you go to their website, there is even a tab specifically for gifts. 
where you can hunt for the perfect item for the pickiest shopper in your life, from Prada sneakers to Gucci lipstick. Sax.com's handpicked guide can help take the stress out of the holidays. And don't forget about yourself. You can add instant cheer to your home with some bright decor or bundle up in a scarf coat from Totem to stay warm all season long. Find gifts guaranteed to bring joy to everyone this holiday season at Saks.com. That is Saks.com for the ultimate holiday gift guide and all the shopping inspiration you need. This show is brought to you by Discover. Have you heard about double nomics? It's okay if you haven't. It's extremely niche and practiced by Discover. Here's an example. Discover automatically doubles the cash back earned on your credit card at the end of your first year with cash back match. That means with Discover, you could turn $150 cash back into $300. It pays to Discover. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Okay, before we get into a new way to understand undecided voters, I just want to establish who you are for my listeners. Back in 2022, when the midterm elections surprised a lot of people... They really didn't surprise you. Um, Back then, the narrative had been that there was going to be a red wave in Congress. Democrats were very worried about that. That's not what happened. I'm a little bit curious. Like, how did you understand what was going on when others didn't seem to? What was the metric you were looking at and what why was it important? I think that two things were going on. One is that the people who were looking at the midterms, the people like who are designated as having the serious opinions, put <laughs> political science hats on and said, well, every midterm almost in American history, the president's party loses a lot of ground. So, of course, that's what's going to happen. And I was arguing from the beginning that like kind of everybody has lost their mind, right? We (laughs) just had an insurrection, right? You would hope that the next election would be a referendum on whether that was okay, right? Right. The media just was locked in on the only thing that matters is rising prices or Afghanistan or some such thing. So what ended up happening was we actually had two midterm elections. We had one that really pretty much followed the dominant narrative script. But in the states that would decide the Senate and these key governors in the Electoral College background, voters really understood what was at stake between Dobbs and January 6 hearings and such. You know, last time around in 2022, You had some criticism for pollsters missing the bigger story because of the questions they were asking voters at the time. You were saying like, oh, they're asking about stuff like inflation and how much they like Joe Biden and all that sort of stuff. But we don't really know how voters feel about MAGA Republicans. And that for you was the key metric, like knowing how energized people were by a perceived threat to democracy. Well, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like in this presidential election, we have better data on how the public is thinking about the MAGA movement? Yeah. I, well, first of all, just one little thing on the question you just asked. I think that it's important to separate how much people care about democracy, which is not all that much, and how much they care about the things that you and probably a lot of people listening to this think of democracy, which is the set of freedoms we have, like the freedom to choose and basic, you know, kinds of freedoms like that. In Europe, that's less the case because they've actually had different kinds of governments, right? They've had, you know, fascist governments, socialist governments, communist governments. Here we just have governments and they're all democracy, right? And so it's just a completely sort of empty word for most people because it doesn't tell them what they actually have to lose in their daily lives. So I guess my question is, we're talking about undecided voters. I think part of what you're implying is that for undecided voters who, as we've said, they may be undecided between like voting or not versus the different candidates – What are they interested in hearing about? What is motivating for them? You said democracy is not it because that's just sort of like a vocab word. It doesn't mean much. What does? Well, let me take a bit of a step back. 
um, that I think sheds a lot more light on this question. As you know, it's been properly identified that young voters are really volatile and important part of the electorate now. And I think that the important thing to understand is that if you came of age in 2008 or later, then you came of age at a time when the entire job market and the the way in which you could live your life changed radically from previous generations. Yeah, you've pinpointed 2008 and the Great Recession as key factors for present day undecideds. Right, because if you came into the job market then or later, you almost certainly had expectations that have not only not been met, but that there is so much precarity in your daily life that I think people who came in earlier just can't appreciate in terms of you don't know or even sort of what you can't even think about career. You don't know quite what your job's going to be in a year or two or even in six months. Do we know that undecided voters or people who report being undecided are more financially precarious than others? Absolutely. I mean, they're younger people who have less financial resources and housing insecurity, and they're much more likely to still be living with their parents. So they go from 2008 or whenever they enter the workforce to 2020 without really feeling traction. And then COVID hits and the lockdown, and they're fired. Now, it's true that fortunately, there were generous checks that they got to you know, keep going. But in America, especially, what you sort of do for work is so wrapped up in your own sense of self-worth that to just have that happen, to be isolated, to not know whether you're going to get hired back at the end of it, um, is again, just really disruptive and disorienting. And throughout this whole period, other than those checks, there's no sense that the government or politicians ever end up really helping you. You know, there's research that the Harris campaign and the Trump campaign are both incredibly interested in moving undecided voters. Like, do we know anything about how an undecided voter makes up their mind? Yeah, I think that most of the kind of people that the election hinges on now really would rather just this whole thing go away. And often it isn't just sort of impatience with it. It's they have two jobs or three jobs or they're trying to juggle childcare or like just getting on with their lives. And as I said, many of these people really um, have low opinion of what politics can do and what politicians say. And so in this week, it's really going to come down to a question of whether they feel a similar kind of threat from the second Trump administration that they did four years ago. And I think one of the things that's really challenging for people who cover politics to understand is that what social scientists call loss aversion is one of the most powerful motivators that people have. What's loss aversion? A classic experiment that demonstrates it is that if you're given the uh, option of flipping a coin in which like the return is $100 if um, it's heads and you give $100 if you lose, no one takes it, right? And it isn't until the odds usually get to like 10 to 1 before someone's willing to risk their $100. Hmm. And because voting isn't an opinion that you ex that you express, it's an actual behavior. You have to get up go somewhere, do a thing, what governs whether you're going to vote or not is that kind of sense of potential loss, which is different from who's better on the economy or something, because that does not map to how these voters are thinking, because 
they're not thinking, wow, I ha- I think I should vote for Trump because he's better on the economy and that'll put more money in my pocket. Pretty much most of those people don't think any of them are really that great on the economy. And they're just only because they're asked by a pollster do they say they think one is better than the other. Young people are not the only ones who might stay home come Tuesday. Moderate Republicans of all ages are also on the fence. And in this final stretch, Kamala Harris is tripling down on them. In recent days, we've seen Harris hit the campaign trail with former Congresswoman Liz Cheney. She's also gathered the endorsements of a whole bunch of local GOP officials. In Mike's eyes, this, too, is a kind of ploy for a very specific kind of undecided voter. I think that what they are trying there is very interesting and potentially could lead to much better showing than people are anticipating. Why do you say that? In this way, we're always sort of astonished and distressed that depending on the survey, two thirds or three quarters of people who identify as Republicans think that Trump won the 2020 election. But there's also, that means a quarter or a third who think he did it and Hmm. who are really increasingly uncomfortable about Trump. And whether it pays off or not, the logic of the Cheney broadly, you know, and the other, uh, uh, amplifying the other Republicans who served with Trump is to create a permission structure for Republican voters to get over it, basically. I think the payoff is pretty substantial because it's aimed at sort of older, regular voting Republican. And the reason it could have a high payoff is a lot of them are going to vote anyway. Just because they do it, because they're like reliable voters. Yeah, they're reliable voters. I think that it's too easy for some people to write off uh working with those Republicans, because I think an important thing to note is that, at least as far as I've seen, um, there's been no policy compromise. Harris has not been saying we're going to work on like our economic progress plan or on fill in the blank. They're just locking arms over preserving a country where they can go on disagreeing about those things. And to you, that's notable, that there's no quid pro quo here, where it's like, okay, if you guys help us win the election, we'll uh, lower taxes for gajillionaires. Exactly, right. It's And that, I think, for people who are too quick to sort of look at, oh, my God, Harris is selling out, I don't see that. I see, really, the... You know, the sentiment that Adam Kinziger expressed it in his DNC convention speech, right, which was essentially, you know, now that I've worked with Democrats, I see they're patriots, too. And sort of the things we were thinking about them are pretty exaggerated. And I want to live in a country where we can disagree about taxes and whatever. And that's exactly the coalition that in a couple months ago, prevented the fascist party in France from taking power even after they won the first round of elections. That's a good point. Right? You had a coalition from complete left to corporate, and same thing in Germany. It's like that's the only way most countries are able to beat movements like MAGA is you know, to put aside their differences, not compromise them, just put them aside in order to be in agreement that that's not the country any of them want to live in. After the break, for undecided voters, which candidate is truly benefiting from 24-7 election coverage? Hey, it's me, the Quenchies. I'm that late afternoon craving you just can't shake. Wait, what's that? Welch's Grape Aid? No! Made with real fruit and no added sugar, 
nothing answers the call of the Quenchies like Grape Aid. Got the Quenchies? Grab a Grape Aid in your juice aisle. In this ad for the Mobile One brand, I have 30 seconds to talk about driving, which might be what you're doing right now. Maybe you're in the car, you're free, you're in control, on an open road with an open calendar. Your mind is wandering, and you're going with it. Or maybe you're stuck at work, in meetings, or emails, or worse, meetings about emails. And if that's the case, there's only one question. Why? Mobile One, for the love of driving. Visit loveofdriving.us slash radio to learn more. The election's kind of everywhere right now. Like, it's on TikTok. It's on the Drudge Report. It's, it's everywhere you go. And you can argue about how the election's being covered. Is it too much horse race coverage versus, like, deep coverage of issues that are important to people and voters? But it is being covered. And in some ways, I wonder who, in the end, this wall-to-wall coverage is good for. Because I think being so ubiquitous... It acts as almost a narcotic, like people just want to shut it out. And if you're shutting things out, that means you're not receiving more information, which is powerful if you're Donald Trump, because the thing that gets people out to vote, as you've said, is him being alarming. And if Trump neutralizes the election for people, if he just causes people to like tune out, that's kind of a net positive for him potentially. Well, it's interesting. This may make you like feel a little better about things. Ooh, I like that. The probably the most reliable predictor of whether disapproval of Trump goes up or down, going all the way back to the first days of his administration, is how much he's in the news. What do you mean? Tell me more. That the less he's in the news the less unpopular he becomes. Huh. That in a way that sort of defies the general rule about not giving things oxygen, you know, it's the opposite. He's his own worst advocate? Yeah, he is Democrats' best negative ad. (laughs) It's funny you say that because we're talking right after this Madison Square Garden rally that he had. And really, the media is reeling from it because it was full of racism and misogyny, like a comic who opened for Trump called Puerto Rico a floating pile of garbage. We could go on. It's like closing argument time, and his closing argument was really a lot. Yeah. It just makes me wonder, like, for undecided voters, which is the group we've been talking about this whole time, Yeah, is Donald Trump really making the best case against Donald Trump? He is, right? I mean, to the extent that this is taking someone who was likely not going to vote, but reminding them of what the next four years is going to be, might might get them out. It's interesting. I was going to ask you about that, though, because I wondered a little bit whether you, who's been someone who from the beginning has been very chill about (laughs) polls. Yeah. I sort of wonder if Kamala Harris's shocking and energetic start as a candidate sort of numbed her campaign to the reality of running against Trump. And what I mean by that is that you've always argued that running against Trump, you need to turn out these undecided, quote unquote, people who are voting against Trump. And like, if you look at the numbers, half of the voters who put Biden in office in 2020 were not voting for Biden. They were voting against Trump. That was their motivation. Exactly. I feel like in the breathless launch of Kamala Harris, like the brat summer and the coconut trees, the thought from Democrats was like, oh, like we have our own motivating person. (laughs) Like we don't need to play by the old rules. And now here we are and we're scrambling to play by the old rules. Right. I think it's a little more complicated than that in this sense, that because Harris got the nomination so late in the process, there were a big set of voters who just didn't know her. For most people, like the threshold question about someone they're going to vote for is whether they're going to feel comfortable 
with that person being the one who gets the call if there's another crisis in the Middle East or, you know, fill in the blank. And whether they feel like in some way that person reflects their values in a way that isn't pinpointed to this policy. And she really had to and did accomplish making those kind of voters feel comfortable with voting for her. And that was, that is always a prerequisite for a campaign. But this is a very short campaign. And so she's now only recently sort of pivoted more towards also like showing up what people have to be concerned about Trump. But she wouldn't have been, if she had started there, I mean, it's just the nature of the the variety of voters that have to be reached, she would have forfeited very many votes. Because she wouldn't have had the buy-in from people. Right, right. And I think what she was trying to say about policy is just simply, I'm not going to do anything radical, right? Because for the people she needed to make comfortable, she just had to walk, as she is, um, capable of making decisions, capable of standing up for what America is, patriotism, and that she begins to inoculate herself against every campaign charge that she's a communist or a Marxist. And I think she's done a really great job at you know, not being labeled that way. I can't tell yet if she's done a great job, but I guess we're all going to find out in like a week and a half. Yeah. I mean, but again, it's it's the what the point you were making a minute ago about the that half the voters who voted for Biden were voting against Trump. The by great job, I just mean that she rapidly got back all the capital D Democrats that were like not there for Biden. And that was sort of the first order of business. Yeah. She shored up the base. Yeah. I'm sort of reminded of like someone who's got like a bag full of oranges and is like trying to like stop spilling them and put more oranges back in. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what it feels like she's doing right now, which is like, I got to get all these oranges in here, but now these are falling out. Ah. (laughs) That's a great metaphor. If someone's got an undecided voter in their life, what should they tell them? Based on what they know that person values in their lives, the risk they're taking by letting Trump come back. Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Michael Podhorzer was the longtime political director of the AFL-CIO. He's now a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and he writes the Substack Weekend Reading. All right, that's our show. What Next is produced by Paige Osborne, Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Madeline Ducharme, and Anna Phillips. We are led by Alicia Montgomery. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. Catch you back here next time. I said to Roger, the last thing you are, fair and balanced. That should have been my slogan. (laughs) When the Fox News Channel first went on the air, it promised to change television. Few broadcasts take any chances these days, and most are very politically correct. Well, we're going to be different. It's going to be kick ass, and I want to be part of it. I'm Josh Levine. In this season of Slow Burn, we'll look at the moment in the early 2000s when Fox News became a political and cultural force. I'm okay with wearing an American flag. And if you're not, I think you need to examine who you are. You'll hear from Fox insiders, many who've never spoken out before. I was not told about that beforehand for good reason. I wouldn't have gone along with it. And you'll hear from the activists and comedians who tried to stop it. He said, you're being sued by Fox. And I went, really? That's fabulous. Slow Burn Season 10, The Rise of Fox News. Hear the entire season now, wherever you listen.